say my name is Angie, I'm an alcoholic. First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, committee. I appreciate you so much for asking me to come here. This has been quite the interesting uh, weekend. And uh, I, I will tell you, uh, Dennis, I, I think you're a wonderful man. I really, truly do. And I, I appreciate you so much. Sam, you, you just cracked me up. There's none other like you. There's none other like you. And to my sisters, who I've spent time with this weekend, I will be uh, forever thankful, forever thankful to you guys. To, to come someplace, uh, it, it's fun. I talk a lot and I travel a lot of places. But to come someplace and connect with people on a heart level has been the most interesting ordeal this weekend. We've had some conversations, and, and I really, truly believe in my heart of hearts that the reality of it is for me is that never, ever in my life have I ever felt, um, and I've searched for many, many years, just to be someplace where I can be Angie. And you, my brothers and sisters, have done that for me. And I come here, and I leave my home at 12.30, and I get here at 6.30, and I'm lost in the woods for an hour and a half. And all I could think about was in most movies I've seen, the black person dies in the first five minutes. And I knew that I was running out of time, and I was running out of time quick. I did everything. I sang Negro spirituals. I did it all. But I knew that I had had to find something that was going to get me out of the forest. And I saw this little office open. And see, I'm a believer in angels. And I saw this little office, and I went and I knocked on the door. and. Uh, <laughs> The woman opened the door and she goes, well, hello. I don't think I've ever seen you here before. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And I'm lost. Could you help me? She gets on the phone and she just starts calling around. She calls here. Where is she supposed to be? Do you know where she's supposed to be? And finally she said, ah, you're in cabin nine. The girls already have your key. Go right down here. And I pulled in and I saw this group of white people uh, headed towards my car. I said, please let this be AA people. <laughs> I said, Lord Jesus, please let it be. <laughs> this lovely woman comes to the, to the window and she said, I saw you in Toronto. And I was like, thank you so much. It's been quite the honor being here. Uh, I've met some interesting people. And, uh, and I enjoy people that like to laugh because you see, as you'll learn from my story, I've been sad for a long time. Sad restless, irritable, and oh so discontent all of my life. And I'll tell you what, I'm, it has on my badge that I'm from Cincinnati. Actually, I'm from Greenville, South Carolina. And back home, we lived on a, on a little red dirt road, and we lived in a little white house. We got our water out of wells. We ate buttermilk and cornbread on a regular basis. We picked black raspberries for fun. And uh, I didn't wear shoes until I came to the city. And uh, I need to tell you that I practice none of those behaviors today. I hate cornbread. And I hate buttermilk. And I hate shoes. But down there, see, I had flaming red hair and freckles, and nobody else in my family did. So my brother shared with me that he knew why I looked the way I did, and he told me that it was because the mailman was my daddy. So whenever I seen the mailman coming, I said, Daddy! <laughs> and I run up to him, and he put his arms around me and tell me that he loved me. And I'll tell you what, one of the most interesting things is I love AA. I love what you learn about yourself. See, my perceptions changed a lot in working the steps and sponsoring people and doing this deal. Because that turned out to be a pattern for me, actually, after I met my daddy, the mailman, that if you just put your arms around me, pat me on my head and told me how cute I was, well, we were basically married at that point. <laughs> you know, six months down the line, I'm going, what you say your last name was again? <laughs> turned out to be a pattern for me. And we stayed down there for a little while. And I'm from a family of Baptist ministers. And we went to the old Southern Baptist churches. And, and they had plans for my life. I've been singing since I was three, and so my family told me at, clearly at the age of nine that, you know, what we want to do, Angie, is you're going to become a great gospel singer, and then you're going to have to take care of the whole family. At nine, that's a lot of responsibility. And I remember being on my big wheel thinking, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> but they say I have to, so I guess I will. Just stressed out at an early age and, and, and responsibility that I didn't know I could uh, uh, do. Um, and uh, my dad ended up getting transferred uh, he uh, moved to Cincinnati, and uh, he traveled back and forth and found us a place to live, and uh, they moved us up, and uh, we were about as country as they came. You know, we came to the city, and uh, in the process of traveling back and forth, my father had found himself a little girlfriend, and so he moved up the hill with her, and that left my mother to raise my brother, sister, and myself. And I need to tell you that when I first got sober, my mother was my biggest resentment. 
I really truly believe that if she would have treated me the way that she treated my brother and sister, that I would not even be in the predicament I am called alcoholism. See, I blame my mother for everything. And one of the reasons why I talk about my mother is because right now my mother is having some mental issues. And my mother doesn't believe in taking medication. And my mother is definitely ill. But one thing she told me not too long ago when I was talking to her, she told me that the daughter that caused her, is mo caused her all the problems is the one that's been the most responsible and reliable. And see, I give that to you, Alcoholics Anonymous, because you taught me. You taught me by example. But it was like, see, I didn't know what it was like to be a responsible member of society when I came into AA. I didn't know anything about that. And you taught me. You, you took me under your wings. And you said, we'll show you this deal if you want to stay sober one day at a time. And so I'm here. I'm able to be there for my mother. It's a sad thing to watch. But the one thing I'm grateful for is that I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous and that I can not only practice this here as I come to meetings and shake your hands and hug you and empty your ass face, can I go home and can I be that for my mother? And I do. I'm, I'm really thankful for that. And so we moved up to uh, this little town and uh, uh, my mother was a, 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 a waitress and she sent us all to private school. You see, she was uh, from the South and she believed in education. And she said that if we didn't do anything else, we needed to be educated because we had a strike against us because we were black. And all my life, even into Alcoholics Anonymous, I believed that I was less than you because of the color of my skin. And I came in an angry, angry woman, angry at the white man, the white woman, until, yeah, well, I'll tell you about my sponsor. She's a white woman, but she's different. And <laughs> so we moved to this little town, and um, my mother sent us to this Catholic school. So now I'm a, a flaming redhead, freckle-faced girl in a white blouse, a plaid skirt, black and white spaldings, and big blue socks, and it's just the biggest red afro you ever want to see it just did not look normal and and then I got beat up on a regular basis and uh, this girl named Squeaky Squeaky was like 16 in the fifth grade <laughs> and uh, you know she hung around with her little posse and uh, one day they stoned me on the way home from school and I ran in the house and I told my mother I said whoo I made it in the house Squeaky and them was stoning me but I made it home mama and whenever my mother sounded like this I knew it was trouble she said you know Angela I said oh here we go she said I want you to go back out there and you stand up to that girl I said what she said, you go out there, you stand up to her, or you stay in here and you get the butt whooping that I'm going to give you. And see, I already knew what that felt like, and I only knew what squeaking appeared to be. So I went back out, and I stood up to her, and I looked at her, and I said, my mother said, I'm supposed to stand up and fight you. She said, well, come on then. So I drew my fist as hard as I could, and I squeezed my eyes tight, and I drew back. I got her right here. Oh, man. I couldn't believe it, man. That was the happiest day of my life. I could not believe it. I hit the giant. I did it. And, and, uh, uh, and then she looked at me. She didn't even budge when I hit her. And, uh, and I said, you get ready to kill me, ain't you? And she said, probably. And she begins to give me the big beat down. But I have this thing in my mind. I have this mental twist called alcoholism that helps me remember what I should forget and forget what I should remember. And what I remember was that I hit her. What I should have remembered was that she beat me down, literally. But see, at that moment, I was a boxer. So from that point on, the only way that I dealt with people was to hit them. When I came into AA, I was known as the knockout queen. Knockout queen, huh? You say something to me? What? Oh, what? My sponsor told me to work a stop. I said, hey, shit, you better ask somebody about me, lady. I have hurt people. And then, you know, you work a few steps and you come around for a little while. You got to get honest. And the reason why they called me uh, the knockout queen was because uh, every time I got in a fight, somebody knocked me clean out. <laughs> So if you're new in the room and you have your chest out and stuff, just put it in. It's not even worth it. You know what I mean? I admit it. You know, hey, I couldn't fight. I had a fight in AA, and, and she beat me up. So you know what I mean? I, I basically just cannot fight. And, uh, and so we, you know, I'm at this Catholic school and, and just kind of feeling like, uh, you know, I hadn't even seen a black person with freckles until I came to AA. I remember I ran up to him. I said, man, where you been? <laughs> you know we related, man. Stick close. It ain't but two of us in the world. You and I, my brother. And... Uh, and, and, and so I'm going to this Catholic school and, and, you know, just acting a complete fool and just, you know, lying and crying. And one day my mother comes and gets me and she takes me up to this uh, house. And uh, at the time we were living in the ghetto. Uh, we were living in the projects. And uh, my mother came and got me from school. I was 12 years old. And she took me to this beautiful red brick house in this neighborhood, all white neighborhood. We were the first African-American family to move in there. And it was a beautiful red brick house set on a few acres. And it was just absolutely gorgeous. And I said, this is our house, mama? She said, yeah. Now, like I said, it was an all-white neighborhood, and uh, so from the age of 13 to 20, I wasn't even black no more. I, uh, I listened to Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band. <laughs> My favorite girl group was Heart. 
First concert I ever went to was Led Zeppelin. And I remember I was sitting at a Ted Nugent Foreigner concert. Foreigner was singing Feels Like the First Time. And I remember I looked around that Coliseum. I didn't see one black person. I said, boy, I am bad. <laughs> I am. They ain't got the nerve to come down here, but I'm down here. I ain't going nowhere. And from that point on, I became a legend in my own mind. Well, I was the greatest person I knew. And I began to go to these concerts and hang out with these girls. And, and these girls, their parents let them drink at home. I could not believe it. They said things like, Susan, um, if you're going to drink, we would really appreciate it that you drink at home. And I remember thinking, well, this is the lovingest family I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> drink at home, and I would drink. What am I remember going home to my mother going, can I drink at home? And she'd say, well, yeah, no. And, um, and so I started hanging out with these girls. And I don't mean any disrespect to AA. I, I know I'm an alcoholic, but there's some drugs in my lead. If you, you know, have a huge problem with it, um, tell Sam. But, um, <laughs> tell Sam, because if you tell me, your feelings might get hurt. So tell Sam. He'll probably listen to it for a while. But, uh. And, and so, you know, I'm hanging out and I'm doing this drinking thing. And my friend Rebecca brings me my first drink of alcohol. She comes over to my house and she's got a brown bag with a couple bottles in it. She gave me a bottle of Boone Farm apple wine. That's a shame. That is a shame. Everywhere I go, I mention Boone Farm. The whole room goes, oh, yeah. Like we were really drinking wine. Ain't an apple never been near that bottle. We could have been eating chopped up sweet tarts, you know what I mean? But we did a boom farm apple wine, yeah. And so she gave me a bottle, and, 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 and she took her bottle, and, and uh, uh, she uh, uh, told me her brother had schooled her in the art of chugging, and, uh, and she told me what to do, and she said, you turn it up, you drink as long as you can, as much as you can, and that's what I did. Now, I need to tell you something. What happened to me, I know without a shadow of a doubt, did not happen to Rebecca, because I drank that boom farm apple wine, and I'll tell you what, something happened. My feet got hot. Oh, they got hot. And well, I based my relationships on the way Boone Farm made me feel that day. If you can make me feel the way Boone Farm made me feel my first drink, we are good to go. I just felt like I should just have a bottle of Boone Farm. Can you make me feel like this? Because if you can, we're good to go. And and and, and I uh I, I you know I hung out with this girl and, and I drank and, and and you know I you know got introduced to some drugs and. You know, I didn't like pot. I felt like I'd just smoke it and then go eat all the stuff that's been in the freezer for 10 years. And, you know, and then, I, I, you know, they gave me a couple hits of strawberry mask one night and told me, you know, only to do one. I did two. And, and, uh, and I have to tell you this story. I, I did the strawberry mask and, and I began to travel with my partners and they're in the backseat for some reason. I'm driving Miss Daisy. I don't understand why. And, uh, and, and, and I get to McDonald's. They say they want to go to McDonald's. And right when I pulled into the lot of McDonald's, the acid began to take effect. And they told me, you know, I'm going to go around the corner. And I pulled up to this little box. And I was appalled that this little person in there was asking me what I want, what you want, what you want. No, what you want. Keep messing with me, asking me what I want. No, what you want. And like I said to him, how, 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 how did you get in there? Help me. Somebody help me figure this out because I couldn't figure how they got in and I just stared at the box. I was so appalled. Then they told me that we had to drive up to the next one. I get to the next one. They all start asking me for my money. What you want my money for? And they begin to slow down. Everything started slowing down. That'll be two dollars and thirty five. So what is wrong with you? And then he began to cry, and the teardrops were bright yellow. And so by this time, I'm at the wheel, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, what's wrong? <laughs> so they exchange these bills, and they tell me to go up to the next window where some guy starts pushing bags at me, and I push the bags right back at him. You know what I'm saying? Don't keep pushing bags at me, man. So we having a fight after we pushing bags back and forth, you know what I mean? And they in the back seat just laughing, right? So they get their food, I get ready to go, my car won't go. It won't move. So naturally, because there's a line all the way around McDonald's parking lot up the street and going down a little, they called the police and, and the police came and he asked me what my name is and I told him it was R2-D2. And, uh, and he didn't take too, uh, too kindly to that and uh, he uh, started talking to me, asking me if I'd had any uh, uh, hallucinogens. I said, uh, no. 
I said, my car won't go, officer. And he starts talking to me. He goes, well. I said, man, just put some handcuffs on me, man, because I'm about to go to jail. I can just stay out right now. He said, ma'am, in America, when we want our cars to go, we put them in drive. <laughs> Pull over there. So I pulled over, and, you know, I started laughing uncontrollably. You know, uh, and, 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 and he took me to jail, and he called my parents. I didn't have enabling parents. He said, you have a collect call from the Hamilton County Justice Center. My mother said, well, I don't know nobody in the Hamilton County Justice Center. And she hangs up, that one phone call. She hangs up. And so I didn't have enabling parents. And, uh, and so I started, you know, just kind of hanging out with people, no longer listening to my parents. My dad had actually got me a job at a recording studio. I've been singing back home since I was three. And I got a job in this recording studio. And one day, I was singing in the bathroom. And I don't know if you're an artist like me, but, you know, I have dreams. And I dreamt that one day, some tall man, be he black, be he white, doesn't matter, was going to say, oh, my God, I just heard you sing. My name is John. I'm from Epic Records. And I just happen to have a contract right here. And I waited for that day. And when I came out of that bathroom, it happened to me, ladies and gentlemen. There was a tall brother standing there, nice suit. He said, I can make you famous. I said, what? He said, I can make you famous. But you're going to have to go to Las Vegas with me. Oh, OK. No problem. So I went back to my family. I said to them, I must go. I must go find my dream. I shall come back for you. My father said, something is wrong with you. <laughs> my daddy kept it real simple. He said, something is really, for real, something's wrong with you. And I said, I'll be back for you. And they begged me not to go, as I, didn't, I knew nothing about this man. And I went to Las Vegas, and I need to tell you, I was a young girl, singing in casinos, making a lot of money, opening up for some of the biggest stars, having the time of my life, drinking alcohol for free, gambling, and caught up in the grips. Caught up in the grips. I'm hanging out with the best of them. I'm singing country Dolly Parton songs. I'm doing all kinds of stuff. Just a legend in my own mind. And I'm drinking and I'm drinking more. And now I know what don't happen here in Pennsylvania, but I begin to, to drink and not remember things. I know it doesn't happen here to you alcoholics. But I began to black out and wake up next to people where both of us look at each other and go, damn. <laughs> oh, man, where Dan at? I told Dan I wasn't going to use no profanity. Where Dan? I'm sorry, Dan. You came and lectured me all good and stuff. Didn't work, buddy. Tell Sam. <laughs> so I'm waking up with all these people, blacking out. I really believed, I didn't hear about blackouts until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I believe that if you drank and you couldn't remember, you had an excellent time. An excellent time. And, and I learned about it. See, the, 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 I, I didn't hear until I got to AA that the first drink was the problem. See, I never heard that. I heard maybe you should not drink uh, liquor. Maybe you should smoke marijuana before you drink alcohol. See, they had all kinds, but nobody ever shared with me it was the first drink that was getting me in trouble. And, and I won't go into detail, but I said, you know, just the whole insane, you know, waking up to some toothless guy named Zeb. You know what I mean? And he's got one tooth and it's cold. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, uh, and just having things began to get, see, I, I believe at that point, looking back in my life, that that's when I began to spiral down, was when I went to Las Vegas. Because I began to drink, and this gentleman, me having uh, uh, no idea about him, uh, was a heroin addict. And introduced me to heroin at the age of 19, and I was shooting heroin intravenously, drinking alcohol on a regular basis, and just declining in Las Vegas. This gentleman went into a store one night and uh, came and picked me up and went into the store and told me that he was going in to buy cigarettes. What he did was he went in and he shot the owner. And when he came out to the car, he jumped in the car with the blood on him, and he said, we need to go. And I'm screaming at him, what did you do? See, you couldn't have told me, and this is the tricky part. If you're new in this room, this is the tricky part about alcoholism. You couldn't have told me that when I took a drink at 13, that a few years later, I'd be on trial for murder. You couldn't have told me that. I need to tell you that that's one of the reasons why I couldn't stay sober in Alcoholics Anonymous for a long time, because, see, I could not share that with you. Because, see, for a long time in AA, I felt like a murderer. I didn't do it, but I was there. I sat there, I drove, and I couldn't tell you that. 
And it wasn't until I shared that in my fourth and fifth step with my sponsor that I got some freedom. Because for the first time, I didn't feel judged by her when I shared that information. And what she did was she put her arms around me and she said, you're a good person, Angie. God's going to use you, but you got to let it go. You got to let it go. And I came back to Cincinnati recognizing that there's some changes that needed to take place in my life. So I come back to Cincinnati and I made a solemn vow. That's it. I'm going to get my life together and I'm going to do what I got to do. And I'm going to be a productive member of society. And I meant that from the bottom of my heart. But see, I didn't know that I was powerless over alcohol and that it dictated and managed my life. I didn't know that. One of the reasons why I'm not too harsh on people that relapse, because I really, truly believe for myself that every time I said I was going to stop, I meant it. But to the untrained eye, we appear liars. I wanted to stop. But I couldn't. A long time ago in Cincinnati, on Sundays, you could get on the bus. And you could ride it all over the city. It was called Sunday Pass Ride. And my brother and sister, I were riding the bus, and we're going all over the place in Cincinnati. And we get downtown Cincinnati to the corner of Liberty and Vine. There's a little restaurant there, and I looked over there, and it was Cadillacs and pimps. And, oh, I couldn't believe it. My brother said, shoot, you couldn't pay me to go over there. My sister said, me neither. And I remember thinking, sitting there thinking, I'm going over there tomorrow. You see, because I got this thing with excitement also. It could be fights, all kinds of stuff going on. As long as you ain't shooting me, I'm basically good to go. As long as you fighting each other and not me, good to go. So I begin to ride the number 20 bus downtown on a regular basis. And I'm hanging out with them. They're gangsters. I'm hanging out with them. Man, the stuff I saw was incredible. Sitting in bars, you know, people come in and empty, empty guns on people. And I'm sitting right there. In my mind, in my mind. See, I was just a little girl from Greenville, South Carolina. See, that didn't happen in Greenville. And I stayed downtown, and I began to drink and drink and drink. One day, end up getting in trouble with the law. Go there, get a physical. They arrest me. Go get a physical. I find out I'm pregnant. And I had been sentenced to a 7 to 25 to the Ohio Reformatory for Women. And I need to tell you that the only thing that kept me from not losing my mind was the fact that my baby was growing on the inside of me. And what I would do is I would rub my stomach on a regular basis, and I would continue to rub it, and I would tell my child, I'm going to get my act together. I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm going to get up out of here, and I'm going to be the best possible mother. And I meant that from the bottom of my heart. But see, what I didn't know is that I could not not stop. I wanted to. Man, I wanted to. I had my son. By this time, my parents had totally kicked me to the curb. And I called my mom, and I said, I got a baby. And I need you to come and get him from prison. And the warden told me if somebody don't come and get him, he'll become a ward of the state because of the time. So I called my family, and they came and got my son. And when they walked out of that prison with them, yeah, that man, this might not mean a hill of beans to you, but when they walked out of that prison with my son, I'll never forget it. He had on his little blue cap and his snap-up thing. And I made a solemn vow. When I looked at my son, I said, I'm going to do the right thing, my son. I'm going to do the right thing. And I meant it. Not even knowing that I got this thing called alcoholism that is so much more powerful than the love I feel for my children. I remember I shared at a meeting one time some feelings that I had about my child, and some old timers shared with me, you wasn't thinking about your kids when you were drinking. Please don't share that information with anybody. Because there was many days when I had to drink because of the disbelief of what I was doing to my children. I didn't want to do it. But when it comes down to alcohol and me, I don't have a choice in the matter. I don't have a choice. I get out of the penitentiary. My son is four years old. All the way down 71 from Columbus, I'm saying I can't wait to see my baby. I get to the Greyhound bus station. Suddenly the thought crossed my mind. It's in more about alcoholism. Suddenly the thought crossed my mind is surely I haven't had a drink in all those years. One won't hurt me. And I took that drink. And the next time I saw my son, he was 10. See, I don't know about you. But what I know is when I put alcohol in my system, what happened to me? Don't happen to my brother. My brother drinks a beer, he goes to work. I drink a beer, I'm on the evening news. That's the difference between me and my brother. So I'm hanging downtown and I'm drinking, I'm going back and forth to the penitentiary. See, in the book it talks about, there's a line in it where it said, alcohol became my master. Alcohol was my master. Could I take these off? Dang. Woo! D. 
Dennis Udelman they had on that letter and our speakers, we asked that they look their best. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm uh, hanging out and get pregnant again. Now I can't even see you. You got to pay to be beautiful, don't you? <laughs> so where was I? Huh? <laughs> Bingo. So I get pregnant with my daughter. Now see, I don't know. Now we all know how babies come about. Well, yeah, most of us know how babies come about. But it seemed to me that it just kind of happened. I didn't know who my baby's fathers were. I get pregnant with my daughter. I don't have one day of prenatal care, and I drink with my daughter the whole entire time. Never went to the doctor. But see, what I had made a decision, I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over across to Indiana, and I'm going to give my baby up for adoption. And I went to Bloomington, Indiana, and I drank and I drank and I drank with her. And I was with a bunch of other drunks one night, and I told them I just... Ain't it time for me to go and labor or something? They said, eat banana peppers. It'll do it. And I ate banana peppers, and it did it. And I went to the hospital. And see, when you give, your, when you give a child up for adoption, they don't let you see it when it's born. So the nurses and the, and, and the doctors was in there, and these two people I didn't even know were in there with me, and they had my legs covered. And I, and I had her. See, I saw this black curly hair. And I said, wait a minute. I don't think this is what I want to do. And it had already been done. And they took her away. They took her away. And I need to tell you that God is just a magnificent work. My mother found out where I was, and she called the hospital, and she told him, you can't give him up for adoption because she has next of kin who will take her. My mother said, Angie, please bring the baby home. Don't do that. And so I brought the baby home on the Greyhound bus. I ain't know nothing about babies. I had this little bit of baby, this little baby with me. I said, please don't cry. I didn't know what to do with her. I said, please don't cry. And she didn't cry. From Bloomington, Indiana, we had to go to Indianapolis to Cincinnati, and not once did she shed a tear. I said, God, she can pee and do do all she like. Just don't let her cry. And I got to the bus station with my baby, and my parents took the baby out of my arm, and they said, we got her from here. And I said, what am I supposed to do? They said, Angie, we can't help you. And they took my baby, and they drove off. And I went back uptown. And from that point on, I began to literally kill myself. I drank as much as I could, when I could, all that I could. My will to live was gone. And I drank, and I drank, and I blacked out, and I blacked out, and I drank, and I shot dope. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. One night, I was shooting uh, drugs with somebody, and they shot ice water into my veins. By this time, I was staying down on the river. And I was staying at this little boarding house, and it was called the Anna Louise Inn. It was a home for wayward women. And every step I took, y'all, if you know anything about shooting ice water in somebody's vein, every step I took, I felt like my life was on the line. And I prayed, because if I didn't know how to do anything else, I knew how to pray. And I said, God, please, God, please don't let me, don't let me die like this. Don't let me die like this. And I walked. And I prayed, and I got down there. I'm a believer of angels, because when I got to the door of that place, there was a little blonde woman standing there. And she looked at me, and she said, you don't have to keep living like this. And she went up to my room with me, and she put a rag on my head, and she began to talk about her drinking. She didn't talk about how much she drank. She talked about how she felt as a result of her drinking. And I listened to her, and she asked me if I would go somewhere with her. And I said, yeah. And she took me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous at 405 Oak Street in Cincinnati. We get to that meeting, and when I came into AA, there weren't a lot of African-American people in AA, so when we walked up, it was about 200 Harleys parked in front. All these white people had white cups. Some guy was playing the guitar singing John Denver songs, and I remember thinking, this is going to be one heck of a party right here. This is going to be a good one. So I walk up the walk, and everybody's like, welcome. Welcome. Then I get to the top of the steps, and this big biker dude, grabs me and picks me up, and he goes, Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Squirrel. Alcoholics Anonymous? Squirrel? So I said, Man, put me down, man. What's wrong with you? And why they name your big butt Squirrel? So she takes me into this big room, and she said, This guy's getting ready to tell his story. And I sat and I listened. I was appalled. 
couldn't believe what he was saying. And then he would say something crazy, and the whole room would bust out laughing. I said, what the? Then he would say some more, and then bust out laughing. I slept under the bridge. <laughs> I said, what in the world? And then y'all got up, grabbed hands, and bowed your hair in prayer. I said, and they hypocrites, too. <laughs> First African-American woman I saw in AA, she was working at the coffee bar. And I went up to her, I said, girlfriend, what is happening? These white people are crazy. She said, oh, keep coming back. I said, oh, no, they got you, too? <laughs> this is some Stepford Wives stuff, isn't it? And, uh, and, and so I stayed around AA for a little while. I mean, it wasn't like I had a, you know, huge social schedule or anything. And uh, about this time, I don't mean any disrespect, please. This is my story. Dennis Colley told me to tell my story. But about this time, they start coming in with this little problem called crack. I know they ain't got it up in Pennsylvania. But down in Cincinnati, they got some crack problems. Well, they start coming into AA. Everybody weighed about 75.9. Everybody's hair stood up. Everybody's eyes was ever so big. I remember saying, what is wrong with you? We smoke crack, we smoke crack. You know what crack is? We smoke crack. I said, no, I can't say I know what that is. But what do y'all do? Get together at 75.9 and then say, let's go get treatment. So they all came into AA talking about crack. Well, you don't bring crack into Alcoholics Anonymous. I ain't going to have it. So I start going around and say, you know, the crackhead's trying to take away AA. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I told him, I said, sit over there at that table and don't say anything to anybody. Maybe they'll come up with a Crackaholics Anonymous, but for right now, you're an Alcoholics Anonymous. Sit over there, and by the way, I will sponsor you. And so I began to read the book to him at the top of my lungs, chapter 5. Rarely! Did you hear what I said? I said rarely! Have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path? Those who do not recover are, and they be sitting there going, this woman crazy as hell. <laughs> this woman got some serious issues. So one of them would want to go to the bathroom. I tell her, hey, what'd you say? I gotta go to the bathroom. Come on. So I walk over to the bathroom, and I stand there at the door. How you doing? Don't go in there right now. There's a crackhead in there. Been in there too long. What's up? Come on up out of there. You're too skinny. You ain't got that much liquid in you. Come on out of there. And then he come out right back to his seat. So sit down. Anybody else got to go to the bathroom? Back to what I was saying. Rarely! <laughs> and so I badgered him and, you know, went around telling everybody. I did everything but had a big picket sign said, crack heads, go home. I did everything. And I'm telling you this to tell you this. One day, wasn't a cloud on the horizon. My mind said to me, you know, Angie, you've been in AA long enough. See, you were talking about God using you as an instrument. I said, you know what? I think God is using me as an instrument also. I need to go out into the world and find black alcoholics and bring them to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I figured that out all in about five minutes. And so I went to the 8.30 meeting because I was sure that since I had been coming to AA telling you that I was here, that surely you would want to know if I was leaving. So they asked if there was any AA announcements. <laughs> Old timer said, and Justin, look here, people. I'm going to roll on up out of here. But I appreciate the really, 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 really big book. And thank you for the coffee addiction that I now have. <laughs> but I'm going to go on out here and help some people. So you know old timers, how sensitive they are. This is one old timer saying, well, get out of here then. There's people trying to stay sober. We'll see you if you make it back. I was like, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Oh, Mr. Man, you've been here way too long. But I'm going to leave. And I took my big book. And I said, the first African-American I see 
that appears to be drinking, I shall carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I uh, got on the number 43 bus headed downtown and a brother got on, you know, appeared to be drinking, had a little sway to his walk, so I slid over next to him on the bus. I said, look here, brother, you been drinking? He said, yeah, I had a little something, something. I said, you might be an alcoholic. <laughs> he said, I ain't no alcoholic. He started cussing me out. And I said, you know, the people at the Double A Club told me that you would probably uh, react like this to my information. So therefore, what I will have to do is what I've done to many people before. <laughs> rally! <laughs> you hear what I said? I said a rally! And the bus driver said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so he pulled over and kicked me off the bus. And I, I called him an alcoholic, too. And, and I went downtown to the slums where I knew black alcoholics were. And I walked into the bar and, oh, they were having such a great time. Well, they acted like it anyway. But I knew better. Why? Because I'm an alcoholic. And I knew really that they were suffering, covering up, acting as if they're having a good time, dancing, knowing they were in pain. So I went over to the jukebox and I snatched the plug out of the jukebox. I said, black alcoholics, they got a place for you. It's called the Double A Club. They will help you with your problem. They said, well, what you doing down here? I said, well, I graduated. I said, the step 17 says that, you know, when I graduate, I'm supposed to come and help black people. And they said, man, get out of here. I said, so, huh, boy, you don't want to listen to my information. I said, this is really, the work of AA is difficult. But seeing that you won't listen to me, what you think I said? <laughs> I did in the bar. I said, rally. Did you hear what I said? I said, rally. Have we? They said, oh, no, 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 no. You've got to go. But listen, suddenly the thought crossed my mind. Said more about alcoholism. Dude, suddenly the thought crossed his mind that he could put a little whiskey in his milk. Suddenly the, cross, the, suddenly the thought crossed my mind that I could just have one drink. One drink. If you're new in the room, that's the tricky part. Because see, that's what alcoholism tells. One drink. That's all. I ain't never had one drink. But see, that's what alcoholism tells me. I took that one drink, and 45 minutes later, I was in a crack house. Well, I ain't thought about smoking no crack. But I need to tell you something. When I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous, June the 20th, 1991, I was in the 75.9 club. And I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I hadn't had a bath in a month. I hadn't combed my hair or brushed my teeth. I did things that I didn't think I would ever, ever, ever do. And I couldn't bring to the forefront of my mind while I was in the slums of downtown Cincinnati how to get out from downtown. I don't know if you know that feeling. I was stuck on stupid. But when I came back, that same old timer that told me to get out of that meeting that night was in the coffee bar. And when I walked in and my hands were swollen because I had been shooting dope in my hands. And my hands were the size of baseball mitt. And my lips were black. My face was swollen. I was a sight. And everything that you guys told me was going to happen, happened. And I came back in the AA. And when I came back, dude said, Angie, you're going to die. And I said, I know. And I don't want to die. He said, if you don't stop, you're going to die. But you know what, y'all? What happened to me when I walked back in the AA? That nasty, homeless girl. I had been living on park benches. Do you understand what I'm saying? sleeping on the ground, wishing so desperately that my life could be different, knowing deep down inside that this ain't the way it's supposed to have went. This ain't how my life was supposed to have went. And he told me to go to the front door and shake hands. And it was nasty, y'all. And I stood at that door and people backed away from me. We got to be real careful. We got to be real careful when these people come in day eight, the ones that don't have their hair combs and are talking to themselves, who have been out on the street. We got to be real careful because they could be your next speaker. We got to be real careful. And I started to, uh, to do the deal in AA. My sponsor is an English woman, and I need to tell you, I wasn't happy in AA. Everything was because I was black. Everything. I would be at the coffee bar ordering coffee. If they didn't get my coffee fast enough, I'd say, it's because I'm black, ain't it? Why I can't get my coffee? Because I'm black. And my sponsor, she's from England, she would just go, would you sit down? I'd say, well, you know, I got to get these people straight because there'd be a woman at the meeting. Happy AA woman. You know, 
when I first came into AA, I really didn't like black people. But now, through the fellowship and the grace of God in AA, I do. And I've been the one, one sitting out there going, standing up going, well, we ain't going nowhere. Power to the people. And my sponsor would say, why do you keep doing that? And I remember I told my sponsor, I said, you know, you being a white woman and all, I'm going to have to talk to you. See, because I'm sensitive, you know, with the cotton picking thing and everything. <laughs> so you're going to have to be gentle with me. Uh, you know, my ancestors worked for you. And uh, so be gentle with me. And she goes, I want you to do this. I want you to grab the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I'd like for you to do is to find in that book where I cannot work with you or I need to work with you differently because you're black. I said, no problem. Newcomer, this is how they get you. She knew it wasn't in the book. She knew it wasn't in the book. But I searched all oh, newcomers. I was looking black, white people. Here lies a hamster, our grenadier, white people. And I read the book. And in the back of the book was a story about an African-American woman that went to her first AA conference. And guess what she said? They treated me like I was one of their own. I said, is this what she wanted me to see? And I went back to my sponsor and I said, is this what you wanted me to see? She said, absolutely. See, I can work with you and you can work with me unless your wine bottle had an afro on it. <laughs> and until you drink out of one that has an afro on it, we can work together. And she began to work me through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I need to tell you that I got busy right off the top. See, because I had been properly horrified and thoroughly convinced that I could not drink one day at a time without the worst of consequences. And I begin to do this deal, and I begin to hang out with these women in AA, these with happy white women in AA. And, and I remember sitting at dinner with them, and they'd just be laughing, 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 and I would just be sitting there going, <laughs> why got me? But then I remembered I hung out with people I didn't particularly want to hang out with when I was out there drinking, so uh, surely I could do it in here. And I hung out with these women. I was an angry, angry woman, and what it was was fear. See, I left home at the age of 13. I didn't know anything about taking care of myself. And anything I learned, Circumstances and situations came from the street. And so I just didn't know how to live life. And see, what I was was I was angry, and I let you know it. Thank God for those of you who knew that I was fearful. Thank God for those of you who worked a program, and they said, Angie, you're just scared. So I ain't scared of nothing. I lived out here in the streets all my life. I ain't never needed nobody. I don't need none of y'all. Help me. I said, help me. I don't want to go back out there. And here I am 14 years later, and I need to tell you, I don't want to go back out there. Because what you did was you took this thug of a girl, and you turned her into a lady. And I watched you, ladies. I watched you how you ate. I watched how you dressed. I watched how you put your makeup on. My, my sponsor had to tell me that I could not put my boss in a headlock because he didn't want to give me a day off. My sponsor wanted to tell me that when I got a dress off, it would be wise that I crossed my leg. What may seem to be simple to you was difficult for me because I had lived a life. I had been reduced to animal mentality. When you would try to hug me, it felt like it burned. It felt like it burned. When you would try to put your arms around me, it just felt like it burned because, see, I was so nasty. I was so dirty. Man, and for those of you who are members of Alcoholics Anonymous, who would tell me, you can be happy too, Angie. You can be happy too. And I began to follow people. I didn't have anywhere to live. I'm the wrong person to talk to if you tell me you can't get sober because you don't have anywhere to live. I got sober in no, not a day for six months that I ever know where I was going to lay my head down that night. But my desire to stay sober was a lot stronger than my desire to drink. And, I would, and somebody would come, if you're black in this room and you feel like they can't help you and they don't understand, let me tell you something. They brought me into their homes never really knowing my past. 
And he said, you can stay here. You can stay here. And so I began to do this deal. And I began to work the steps. And I began to go, I started going to conferences. And I just started going into the prison. Able to walk out after the meeting was over. What is that about? What is that about? And I remember I used to just jump from side to side, like to the door, I'll go. Because I got to leave. I got to leave. And I just started doing what y'all told me to do. I started doing what y'all told me to do. I began to read Bill's story, and it made sense to me. It made sense to me. I began to do what you, not you said you suggested it, but I knew you were really telling me what to do. Newcomer, if they say they suggest it to you, that's not what they mean. You don't really have a choice in the matter. Because if you don't do it, they ain't going to work with you. You know, so they say, well, I would suggest. And they use the two Gs real hard. Suggest that you do this. And I'll tell you what, I think that fourth and fifth step gets a raw deal. Because I will tell you what, the, the skies didn't part and I didn't feel like I was floating on air. But it said, and in the last paragraph of chapter 5, it says that you will have digested some chunks of truth about yourself. That's what the fifth step did. I began to see that who I thought I was and who I really was was two totally different people and that I walked around resentful at people not for what really happened but for what I perceived to have happened, which was totally different from what really happened. And I began to just do this stuff, y'all. And I came to the AA and I didn't have, I didn't have an education. I didn't go far in school. Well, I had a GED, but I had made it when I was in prison. And I gave it to my boss. And he fell for it. He put it in my personnel file and it gave me the job. And I thought, well, this ain't too bad. And I worked this job for years. And one day I was sitting at a meeting and a woman was talking about the fact that she was going to college and she was excited about it. And for the first time in a long time, I thought, I wonder if I could go to college. And then that still knowing voice inside that I choose to call God said, nah, with that fake GED, you ain't going to college. <laughs> So I told my sponsor that the GED was fake, and she told me that I needed to go tell my boss. I said, he's going to fire me. She said, that's the chance you got to take. And I went and I told him. I said, Roger, I don't have a high school education. He said, well, sure you do. I got it right here. And he pulled my file out. I said, that's not real. And he looked at it. He said, this ain't real? I said, no, I made it in prison. <laughs> Well, that's kind of good. He said, but you can't keep it and stay here. I said, you fired me? He said, no. I'm going to give you six months. You need to get your high school education. So you know on TV where it says, get your high school education on TV. So I sent in and I started ordering the books. And see, what you did was you read the book, you studied, you took the test, you sent the grades back, they sent you another book, you studied. And that's what I did. And when I got my last test and I passed it, I went and I signed up for the GED and I got a perfect score on the GED. <laughs> man, that might not be a lot to some people, man, but when I got that thing in the mail, I just fell back on the bed. I said, thank you, God. Thank you. Because I didn't know not having it played a part in the way that I felt about myself. And I took that GED and I went to the University of Cincinnati and I said, I want to go to college. And they said, what you want to do? I said, I don't know. Help me. So there was a woman there who had heard me talk. And she uh, worked at UC. And she said, Angie, why don't you get certified in addiction studies through the University of Cincinnati? And I said, OK. So I went and I did it. And I got it. And I said, well, let me go a little further. And I said, I need to get my bachelor's. And so I've been working on my bachelor's, been on the dean's list. And, and I'm just doing the deal. And see, I didn't believe, I believed that I was going to die drunk. I really, truly did. But man, you guys gave me hope, and I believe, this is just me, I believe that that is what I'm supposed to portray from this podium. Hope. That no matter how far down the scale you have been, you will see how your experiences can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. Here's a good one. You will suddenly realize that God is doing for you what you can do for yourself. And man, I hung in and I did the deal and I continue to do the deal. 
So they call me. I speak. I speak for what's this? My chauffeur's name? Tom. I'm gonna break your internet. Big Ivy League attorney. Best school, good suburb. Driving a little crackhead black girl around. I said, we was in the back seat, like, go, Tom, go, Tom, go, Tom. <laughs> and I talked there, and Tom sent my CD somewhere. Don Cassini sent my CD. Who is my baby's daddy? Thank you very much. Don Cassini is. And sent my CDs all over the place. People start calling. What? You want me to come in? But then I get a phone call. Hi, this is so-and-so from World Services in New York. We were wondering if you'd be interested in speaking Friday night at the International Convention. I said, Tony, man, quit playing on my phone, man. Why are you always tripping, man? Don't call my house no more. He said, ma'am, this is so-and-so from New York. So I went in my bedroom and looked at the caller ID. I was like, oh, man, I am too sorry. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to talk at the International. Me? Yeah, you. We heard your tape. What? So when I got off the phone, I laid on the bed, and I thought, what? So I called my sponsor, I said, they want me to speak at the International. She said, what? <laughs> I said, I know, that's what I said. And I wasn't even going to the International because I couldn't afford it. Plus they had that little thing where if you've been to jail, they wasn't too sure they wanted me to come across the board. But the moment that I said yes, things began to happen. People called and said, you can stay with us. Well, we can drive. Sent my papers to the Canadian consulate. Had to go to the, 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 the courthouse, get photocopies of my crimes. And I read those papers and I'm saying, is this me? They said, I got a whole lot of money right here. I ain't got no money. And I read it like I was reading somebody else's deal. And I made photocopies and I sent them to them. Called dude in New York. I said, I just sent my paperwork. He said, I want you to call so-and-so at the consulate. I called so-and-so at the consulate. He said, we got your paperwork. He said, I need you to call this person at the consulate. I called him. And then I stopped for a minute and thought, man, I'm talking to people at the Canadian consulate. If they don't let me over, just talking to me is enough for me. And I got my letter the day before, the day before saying, welcome, you are now allowed to enter Canada. So I get to the border, this clown looks in the car and goes, go ahead. I said, oh no, <laughs> oh no, mister, you will look at these papers. I think not. I even had my little sponsor indignant. She goes, oh yeah, you're going to look at these papers. <laughs> and he's looking at the papers and he's laughing. I said, I paid $200 for these damn papers. You're going to look, act like you're reading something. So he's, he's looking at the papers and you can see his shoulders going. <laughs> so he gave them back to me. I said, thank you. Now tell me what you said a minute ago. You may now enter. Thank you. <laughs> so I get there and I go into the stadium. They told me I had to be there for a sound check. And I go into the stadium. Goodness gracious alive. I look at that stadium, ain't nobody in there. And I look around and I thought, what in the world? So I do the sound check. I go back to my hotel. I have a total meltdown. <laughs> Why did I think I could do this? <laughs> I hope I don't drink here. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you doing this to me, God? My sponsor is sitting over on the chair going, very interesting. <laughs> so she's helping me. And I get there and I tell you what, I saw those bagpipes come out. I don't know if you were there, man. In the flag ceremony. And then I heard him say, Angie P on standby. And I walked up them steps and I kid you not, I heard music in my head. And when I walked out there and I looked, I said, what the heck? <laughs> And all I could do was do my best because I was so proud to be a member of this organization. Do you understand me? 
People say, where are you know? No! Did you just see the flag ceremony? And I talked for 20 minutes. And I tried to get it in in 20 minutes. Ooh, I did. I tried. I wanted y'all to know everything about me in 20 minutes. But now you get to hear the whole story. Man, I am a spiritual woman. So I'm standing in front of all these people. And for just one second, I thought, man, I am bad. Woo-hoo! Really? Just for a split second. I had to go there. And then I had to get back and humbly offer myself to thee. But I'll tell you what, changed my life. And from since then, since my phone been ringing off the hook. Can you speak here? We'd like for you to speak at the Big Island Bash in Hawaii. What? Can you come over here? Can you come over there? Can I come? I remember one time they called. I said, let me look at my book. <laughs> let me check my schedule. Uh, yeah, I'll be there. And I'm booked all the way up to 2007. I told them, book me as far away as you can because I knew I'll stay sober. Because I like what I do. I love what I do. Things have definitely changed. My children, let me tell you, my son is now 22, and he is, wants to be a rapper. I would be happy for him if he could rap. We all got together so we could listen to him his debut. And he just got up there and just started doing some wow. And a, and a, and a one eight hundred and eighty two and a what what what? I'm like, oh baby, get a job. You get yourself a job with the quickness. And now he's selling cars. <laughs> and my daughter is in college in Louisiana. And my daughter is 18. Man, if I'd have got what I deserved, my kids wouldn't even speak to me. Man, I'm glad I'm one of God's girls. And see, at five years sober, my family asked me if I would step away from them. And I was telling the ladies earlier, my parents said, we don't want you to come around, Angie. We want these kids to have the same opportunities that you did. And so at five years sober, I was no longer allowed to see my children. But you see, I don't care what they said. They were my baby. And I began to go to their soccer games. And I was sitting at the soccer game with sunglasses and a baseball hat. See, I had to go. I had to go see him. And I sat at my son's basketball game with my family there, and they didn't even know I was there. But I had to see him. And the day that my son turned 18 years old, he called me. He said, Mama, I want to see you. And I sat there with my son as he sat across the table and I told him, I don't want you to think for one second that I did not love you. Because I did. And when they asked me to step away, I did it because I loved you. And my son took my hand and he said, Mama, it's going to be all right. I said, I know. He said, just don't drink it in. One day at a time, son. I'm going to do everything I can. And my daughter, her 18th birthday, she called me. She said, Mommy, I want to see you. And I went and I got my daughter. And we rode around and we talked, man. And she put her head on my shoulder. And she said, you love me, don't you? I said, absolutely. Absolutely. Everything I did and every moment that I stayed away from you, it was because I loved you. I didn't want to cause you any harm. My daughter left for college. And two days before college, I was able to go shopping with her, help her get her stuff for her dorm. And then when she got to the airport, she was getting ready to go, and I felt like I just got him back. I felt like I just got him back, and here she is going to college. And she ran up to me before she went to go get on her plane, and she put her arms around me, and she said, I love you. Everything is going to be okay. 
and I love you. And she walked away. And so I had some months with my daughter. But I need to tell you that every, every night up until the hurricane hit, she called me. She called me to tell me what was going on in college. And then she called me when the hurricane hit. We hadn't heard from her in a couple of days. And I said, oh, my God, God, don't tell me that I lost her. Don't tell me I lost her. And when she called me, she said, Mama, they hungry down here, Mama. She said, they don't have nowhere to live, Mama, and I don't know what to do. And I said, let's pray. And I said, let's pray that prayer that I told you about. And together, I said, you just listen to the words of the prayer. And I said, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those that I would help with thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. That's what you do. You ask God for help. And I'm here to tell you that her and her little soccer team, they've been feeding. They brought them up to her college. Tulane was wiped away brought her up there. She said, I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm doing what you told me to do. What God told me to do, I'm doing. She said, are, she said, are you doing what God told you to do? I said, you know what? I'm getting ready to go to a place called Cook Forest. Pray for me. <laughs> she said, you think about me, and I think about you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a lover of Alcoholics not. People said to me, you've been smiling all weekend. I ain't got a damn thing to be sad about. What a deal we got. What a deal we got. That we get to take all of our experiences. I need to tell you that the only reason why I got hired for the job that I now work at is because I'm an alcoholic, I'm a thief, I'm a liar, and I'm a good detective. And I run a program for doctors and lawyers and pilots and nurses who have alcohol and drug problems, who have somehow or the other got an infraction with the boards. And what I do is I spend my day working with them up to three years and then being an advocate to the medical board, the FAA, the whole shebang, me, going into the court system, talking to the judges, the same ones, say, hey, don't you look familiar? I say, yeah, what's, does this look familiar? <laughs> And I'm a believer without a shadow of a doubt that today I do what I do because in 1997 I answered my call. And I said to God, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, I'm willing to go. And so wherever I'm called, whether it's cooked for, wherever, absolutely, I'll be there. Life has been an awesome journey in my recovery, ladies and gentlemen. You have loved me more than I ever thought anybody could love me. And I know without a shadow of a doubt this weekend, when you guys came to me and you said you touched me, you moved me, I thought about you. A woman told me I listened to your story just last night. I know that when I, my head hit that pillow last night that I have done the work that God has chosen me to do. To be an example of how good alcoholics and not is to stand upright and steadfast in my journey to show the power of God. And I'm going to share this with you, and then I'm going to be quiet. There was a song that my grandmother loved, and my brother, grandmother has passed over. But I get it with you, and I hope you like this song. Amen. But now I'm 
Thanks for listening, ladies and gentlemen.